Wow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Snover. Yeah, I'm glad you applauded before my talk. I'm not sure it'll go after, at the end. Well, howdy, I'm Jeffrey Snover. Uh, we're gonna talk about PowerShell and, uh, and this year. Oh, you know what, I should, I got the wrong dang thing. Oh, hell. Don, oh, give me one minute. <laughs> It's almost right. You know, have, if, if you ever heard the story that PowerShell's so awesome because I'm such a flawed person, that's not actually a joke. That's a true thing. And I was looking for a clicker here. You found it? No. I think it's on my floor at home. Okay, well, there you go. Not going to go very far. Hey. Um, yeah, so it's, it's true. PowerShell is such a great product because I'm such a flawed person. In fact, uh, first thing this morning, I was sitting right down here getting ready, cleaning things up, and I deleted most of my demos. So, <laughs> no, I, I did. Um, so there might be a few rough spots. Let's see. Okay, so it's 2018, and PowerShell's never been more important. That's really the end of my talk. You know, I mean, they got some details, but this is it, right? Yeah, you know, is PowerShell done? No, it's not done. Is it important? Oh my heavens, it's never been more important. So why is it that PowerShell is so important? And you know, we used to say, oh well, you know, there's this inflection point, the cloud, and the cloud changes everything. But that's not really it, right? What's really it, there is an inflection point, but the cloud is a technology. The inflection point is digital transformation. Digital transformation is, in the grand arc of computing, this huge inflection point that's going to affect everyone in this room, everyone in our industry. And why this is so important is that automation is the thing that enables digital transformation. And that's why PowerShell is so critical, more critical now than it's ever been in the past. Digital transformation does not work without automation, okay? So you might have heard of this thing called Moore's Law, right? Doubling of, of uh, transistors every year. It's sort of been the kind of foundation of our industry for the last, what, 30, 40 years, right? Heard all about that. Well, I'm here to tell you that this is less important in the future and that what's more important for the next 20 years of computing is what I call the other Moore's Law. And this other Moore's Law is Jeffrey Moore, okay? Now this has a link here, a uh, seven minute video that explains this in great detail. I encourage you to watch that. But Jeffrey Moore basically drew this distinction. He said, listen, every company participates in two activities, something he called core and something he called context. Core are those things that advance your mission, that differentiate you from your competitors and allow you to charge money, okay? Context is everything else. So let me give you an example. Microsoft, our core is software. So we go out of our way to find the world's best software people, hire them, treat them well, develop software. But in order for that to work, we have to do have things like receptionists, shuttles, cafeterias, right? These are not core to our business. If Microsoft was awesome at our cafeterias, no one would buy more of our software, okay? So these are the everything else. They're important, but we just want to write a check for them, right? We, so to be concrete, we have no technical fellow of the cafeterias, right? No distinguished engineers of the shuttles. Now we pay a lot of money, we want great service, but Satya never like gets his leadership team together and like, okay, let's go over the menus for next week's lunch, right? This, just not something where you put your energy on, right? You put your energy and your best people on the things that differentiate you. But you have to do this other stuff. Now then, he drew this other axis, and that's mission critical. Here's the definition of mission critical. Screw up, you're effed, okay? <laughs> I'm trying to clean up my act. Okay, so screw up and you're effed. And, and then everything else, right? So the interesting part about this is that, of course, this is where you make all your money, but this is where your risk is. So you might say, well, hey, how can something be mission critical and still be context? And the answer is that um, when you have something that is core and mission critical, that's where you're making all your money, over time, the market will respond. 
it will respond with an alternative, with a substitute, or with something that uh, uh, becomes uh, 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 you know, different. And so you're no longer able to charge a premium for this, okay? But it's still mission critical, which is to say if you screwed up, you're effed. So uh, this is what happened. This is where you get risk, right? This is where Jeffrey Moore says is he called it the killing field of once great uh, of companies, okay? And so what you want to do is you want to focus all of your energy on the things that differentiate you, the things that you and only you can do, and then de-risk everything else. So how do you do that? And the answer is you've got to reduce the risk here. By the way, one of the reasons why it's the killing field is often because it's mission critical and often because to become successful, you had to incur a lot of technical debt, you know, often these things are a mess. And so you got to go invest, try and people will increase their investment at a time when they can no longer charge a premium and that's where they end up dying. So what you have to do is you have to reduce the risk of these things by reducing the complexity. And the way you reduce complexity is you standardize. Put it all underneath one person, standardize things. You automate, 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 and then you take the components and you either offshore them, you outsource them, or automate them. Okay, so that's the heart of this. And what this does then allows you to take resources out of what is mission critical and focus in on mission critical core, the things that differentiate you. So the heart of this digital transformation, and by the way, this is digital transformation 101. We're going really quick through it. But at the end, it's not that complicated. Okay? At the end, it's not that complicated. What you want to do is you want to build the things that advance your mission, that differentiate you, that you're able to charge a premium for, and you want to buy everything else. Right? Or just write a check. Okay, it's that simple, really. Now, sounds great. How do you do that, right? You just go to your boss and say, hey, give me some more people. Went to this talk, Jeffrey Snover, oh my God, digital transformation. I'm totally in. Uh, this is what we must do. I just need a 40, 50, 100, 200 more heads, right? Anybody going to be successful with that conversation? No, exactly, smart crowd. No, you don't, right? That's not gonna work. So, but in order to pursue digital transformation, right? Because guess what? The folks who get this right are gonna win and the folks that don't are gonna lose. How do you do that? And the answer is the only people that are gonna be successful with digital transformation are the people that do these two things. Number one is you gotta create bandwidth. You gotta create bandwidth out of the stuff you're doing right now. And then with that bandwidth, you invest that in innovation, and then you do it again, and again, and again, okay? So, how do you create bandwidth, right? The answer is, it's pretty simple. First is software as a service, right? If there's a software of a service out there for something that you're doing by yourself, you should just bite the bullet and take advantage of that software as a service. Let me give you an example. Um, there is no airline that can put more people in planes because they can run exchange better than their competition, right? Nobody is going to be able to sell more sneakers or shoes than their competition because they can run team service, you know, teams, Visual Studio team services, right? These are important things, right? Email, mission critical, but it doesn't differentiate you. So in reality, you should just write a check. We run those things really well. There's lots of SaaSes out there. When you, if you have a choice, you should just use a SaaS. Now, number two is lift and shift, right? Lift and shift is the term where you take existing virtual machines uh, and, or physical machines and run them in the cloud. And you'll see that just running them in the cloud actually generates bandwidth. And the reason it generates bandwidth is because running in the cloud, the cloud vendors provide so much functionality for you, okay? I'll give you some examples of that. But then it's automate, 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 right? How much of the stuff do you do today is just click next, click next, click next. Good Lord. Instead, you automate that stuff. When you automate it, you free up resources. What do you do with those resources? You invest in automation. Okay, so this is where you want to invest, right? This is where you take those people and you're going to invest in, you know, um, uh, uh, new architectures, 
All right? These new architectures should take advantage of cloud uh, services like PaaS. That allows you to focus most of your energy, right? Here, here's the heart of it. You want to be really good at like listening to customers, figuring out what they're really saying, and then delivering that as a set of features very quickly, and then doing it again. Okay, so listen, react, deliver, listen. Fast, fast, fast. PaaS services allow you to, to do that, right? To spend more of your energy doing that than, oh, hey, there's a new patch of the operating system, blah, 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 blah. Don't do any of that. We do that for you. The next is to embrace DevOps. Now, anybody been to a DevOps conference before? Yeah, yeah, okay, great. DevOps, fantastic stuff. If you go to a DevOps conference, what you will find is they spend an inordinate time, amount of time talking about what DevOps is and isn't, and no one ever agrees, ever. Uh, so here's, here's the primer. I can save you all like lots of time and money. DevOps is really only two things. One, it's to go faster by doing smaller batches, more frequent smaller batches. And number two is stop being an asshole to your fellow team members. <laughs> really, that's it. No, seriously, it is. It really is. Where the other team members, you know, the developers are jerks to the operators, the operators are jerks to the, no, you're all part of one team focused in on advancing the, 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 um, the customer value proposition. It reminds me of this funny story. Ever, ever heard of this guy, Curtis LeMay? You know, Curtis LeMay was this Air Force general, they call him general. Anyway, his Air Force guy, and a cold warrior, right? And at some point, one of his uh, lieutenants is there talking about, you know, the, you know, talking about the Russians. Oh, the enemy this and the enemy that. And Curtis LeMay said, young man, just stop that right now. He says, I want you to stop referring to the Russians as the enemy. They are our adversary. The enemy is the Navy. Okay. So, <laughs> Anyway, so you want to embrace DevOps, okay? And then what do you do in innovation? Is you automate, you automate, you automate. Now, why is it important here as well? And the answer is in the first case, you automate to create bandwidth. But here you're automating to, be, to increase quality and speed, okay? So you want to get to a world where when you make a change, you quickly uh, build that, you automatically build that change, automatically test that change, and if the tests succeed, you publish it. Right, Michael Green's here. Hopefully he's gonna give a talk on that. Where's Michael? Somewhere. Perfect, so Michael Green's gonna talk about that. Uh, but you wanted to automate, automate, automate to increase the quality of your operations. So the heart of this is that those people that get digital transformation right are gonna have a, just a huge business advantage a huge business, business advantage. They are gonna flourish. And the people that don't, not so much, okay? So excellence at digital transformation means winning. Excellent at automation means winning. I truly believe that. The people who are great at automating are gonna deliver their company such huge advantages that their careers are gonna prosper, their company's gonna prosper. It all starts from the customer, right? You can't have a failing business and you succeeding with your career. It doesn't work that way, right? So the customer has to be successful. Your company has to be doing great with the customers. From there, the customer prospers. And if you've been part of that chain, you will prosper as well. So getting excellent at automation is, is all about winning. Great. Digital transformation. So it's just Windows PowerShell, right? Yeah? And the answer is no, no. Windows PowerShell is all about Windows, right? Or as one Microsoft executive told me, Jeffrey, exactly what part of fucking Windows is confusing you? He's <laughs> <laughs> trying to introduce a CLI. He's like, Windows, Jeffrey, Windows. Anyway, <laughs> that was a painful period. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the reality is, is the world is heterogeneous. Right? The world is a lot of Windows, but there's also a lot of open source Linux. And that services, 
services are just as important as machines and in case in a lot of cases they're more important than the machines and guess what when you're managing services it really doesn't matter what how that service is implemented windows or linux you still have to manage the service but you're not like logging into the machine that runs the service you're here and you're managing that remote service okay so that is is perhaps more important than managing individual machines and in reality, the cloud really does need much better programming in the large support than PowerShell has right now. It's gotten better, but there's much more to do here. And that services require the control and bug fix timing open source provides. So I don't know how many people, how many people uh, are using WMF 5.1? Okay, okay. Now, did, did you notice that WMF 5.1 had some cool new debugging features? Like, you could debug desired state configuration resources for the first time, you know, feasibly for the first time ever. Like, yay. And did you notice that you can do uh, step into, you know, you can step into a function? Uh, well, with 5.1, you can step into a function on a remote machine and de have a remote debugging session there. Okay, now, why did those, those were not part of the plan. Right, those are not part of the plan. But we've been focused, I've been focused in on Azure Stack, and at some point we were just dying. We are dying because we didn't have these debugging capabilities. And I went to the team and I said, you, you, gotta, you gotta stop, I, you gotta deliver these things. And they're like, well, Jeffrey, we got the schedule, we got this priorities, and uh, you know, it just doesn't fit. It's like, I'm sorry if that sounded like a request. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta stop. I mean, we're dying here. I need this solved like right frickin' now, and it's not a negotiation. It is not an option, right? We've got to solve this problem. And the point is that, that when you're a service, you know, you, you need solutions, and if, they, if you will bring up your compiler and you bring up your editor, you'll solve your own problem. Like if I could have done that, we would have just done that. But at the time, we couldn't because we were using Windows PowerShell. So open source means that you are empowered to solve your own stuff. Now, you don't want to create your own fork, your own branch. Well, actually, you do for very short periods of time. And then you want to do a PR and have them fix it and then get back on the main line. But when you're delivering something in production, you need the timing and the bug fix, you know, the, the control and bug fix timing that open source provides. So the conclusion when we thought about this was we actually needed a new tool. Right? That Windows PowerShell was not going to do it for us. Okay? However, there was this thing we called the sacred vow. Okay? The sacred vow was we as, as individual members of the PowerShell team stood out and said, we make a commitment to you. We know you're very busy, your hair's on fire, and the last thing in the world you want to do is to stop and learn a new language, learn a new tool, PowerShell. But we asked you to make that change. We asked you to stop doing what you're doing and learn PowerShell. And in exchange, we would do everything in our power to make sure it was the best investment you ever made, okay? So we're gonna make it as powerful as we can. When a new problem came up, we're gonna reuse PowerShell. I mean, how many times as a, as a, as a customer of Microsoft, Microsoft would get on some technology and I'd go tell my bosses, hey, we gotta do this, this is super important. And for a you know, year and a half, two years, I'd seem like a smart guy. And then Microsoft would wanna solve a new problem and they'd abandon that technology and pick up a new one and I look like a jerk to my boss. Right? And we said, we're not going to do that. When we have a new problem, we're going to figure out how to take the tool that we have and extend it to meet that new problem. And that is our sacred vow to you. So yes, it's just PowerShell. And here the key is we're dropping the Windows portion of that. Okay? Oh, yay. One. Yay. So this really was kind of a, a hit refresh. That's our, our new boss's uh, great phrase, hit refresh moment. Where when you hit refresh, you keep the things that are great and bring you, and give, deliver you a path to the next 15, 20 years. And then the stuff that don't, you leave behind, okay? So that's what we do. We have a new mission. And the new mission for PowerShell is to enable and empower this digital transformation, right? So we wanna be able to manage from any client, 
be able to manage any server or service running on any cloud, AWS, Google, Azure, or on-premises running any hypervisor, VMware, Hyper-V, whatever, any storage stack, any networking. This is the tool that you can now finally bring your teams together, converge on a common tool set, and manage everything in your estate, right? I've been in this business a long time, and I can't tell you how many times people have asked for this tool, and this is really, for the first time, the time where we've been able to actually deliver that. So, great, sounds great, but a lot of people are like, yeah, but right now, I'm using Windows PowerShell. What's that mean for it? And the answer is, Windows PowerShell is complete. Okay, we're complete. It's gonna be fully supported, probably forever, right? Command.exe, still supported. It was deprecated, I think, in 2008, a long, long time ago. Uh, Command.exe was deprecated, still fully supported. If it's used, it's supported. That's sort of the model. But we will have no new feature development on Windows PowerShell. We'll do security fixes and blocking, uh, customer blocking bug fixes only. And that all of our investment was going to go into this new PowerShell. And because this new PowerShell uh, had a number of, uh, you know, needed to achieve this new mission, there were quite a few small breaking changes. Uh, and so we decided that if we just kept the name PowerShell.exe, that there would be enough uh, little hiccups that, uh, that would be uh, uh, jarring to people. So we gave it a new uh, executable name, PWSH. So here's a question everybody asks. So what's that mean? Am I screwed? Anybody feel screwed yet? Not yet. Okay. So the answer is no. You're not screwed, right? As I said, command.exe, we've had no changes in command.exe in over 20 years, right? And it's still used, right? I mean, we deprecated it a long time ago, and we don't use it because we don't deprecate it. We don't remove it because so many people use it. PowerShell version 1 was at least 20 times more powerful than command.exe. It really was. And since then, we've had five releases, 5.1 releases. Um, you know, just think about the difference in language between what you're able to do in PowerShell versus command.exe, right? And the coverage, both first party and third party, the consistency, uh, the fact that we have universal remoting, the ability to manage heterogeneous jobs and background activities. We have an eventing model. We have incredible security, like the best security out there. Uh, we've got desired state configuration, the ability to share information with the galleries. We have authoring and debugging tools. We have classes. We have a script analyzer and fantastic extensibility, okay? So in reality, I mean, I, I called this last year, and boy, I think I was absolutely right. Last year, I stood up here and I said, hey, in reality, the bulk of the innovation in PowerShell, in the PowerShell ecosystem, has shifted from the PowerShell team to the community. And it's absolutely true. Just go up to the gallery, you'll see that. When you talk in the hallways, you find people that talked to somebody last night, wrote PS Graph. Right? It's domain-specific language that you can type and get graphical uh, displays using PowerShell. Fantastic stuff. So the community is really where this innovation is happening, and we've given, we've given the community the right extension points that they can continue with this um, 5.1 for a very long period of time. But we'll hear people say, hey, that's great, like I'm in, sounds good, sounds like I'm covered on this Windows Server Windows PowerShell front, but this PowerShell version 6 front, man, you know, that's, it's not there, right? Because there's a, a bunch of stuff that's not in PowerShell version 6. And the answer is that's right. You know, really it's kind of PWSH v1. We chose PowerShell version 6. So part of this is stuff that will never come in, right? That's our hit refresh moment. So things like workflow, you know, we went and talked to people and we said, hey, are you using workflow? And the strong answer for the community was no. So that's not something we, we went forward with. If we're wrong on that, we're community driven, you'll tell us and we'll change that. But we've been asking quite a bit now and, and nobody's been saying, yeah, that was a critical thing. 
Same thing with snap-ins, right? Good Lord. We tried to get rid of snap-ins since version one. Actually, before version one, we always hated that thing. Um, and WMI, right? We're trying to shift everybody to SIM. So there's stuff that we don't think is ever coming back. But then we're built upon .NET Core, right? And .NET Core uh, is smaller than .NET Desktop. Well, when we first released uh, Core PowerShell, we did it on uh, .NET Core version one. And they heard, you know, it was actually quite a big uh, uh, lift for us. That, that team heard that they had overly, been overly aggressive in refactoring the frameworks. So in .NET Core version two, they doubled the number of APIs. And now with the Windows compatibility pack, they have doubled that yet again. So, you know, uh, we are kind of following the lead of the .NET community. They are doing all their new stuff on core. They're investing heavily. And at the, at the beginning, when you make these kind of big shifts, sometimes there's a take back. But when you're on the right technology and the right architectural thing, you pretty quickly make that up and then are able to accelerate even faster. And that's what we anticipate will happen with the .NET community. Of course, you have PowerShell remoting and PowerShell remoting works between these two environments. From PowerShell version six, you can call PowerShell version five. From PowerShell version five, you can pow call PowerShell version six. In fact, that's true all the way back down to two point, you know, PowerShell version two, and will be true up to PowerShell version, you know, a billion, right? That's a contract that we make. So you have interoperability, which is to say, if you're running a PowerShell version uh, six environment, and uh, there's something that is not a there, you can remote to a machine and call it in PowerShell version five. I'll show you a little bit of a demo there. And if there's stuff that we're missing, w please tell us about that. We prioritize, we are here to serve you. So, and also, uh, if you, uh, you, know, you go and say, hey, this, this product doesn't have PowerShell version six support, don't tell the PowerShell team about that. Go to that individual team and say, hey, bucko, maybe you're not up on current events, but uh, the future here is, is PowerShell, not Windows PowerShell. We need you to get PowerShell version six support for your, plat for your product. Your voices, right, under Sacha's model, right, Sacha basically said, hey, um, get out of your office, go talk to customers, give them what they want. Stop talking to guys like me and Racinovich who are saying, hey, the right thing to do is this. It has, still happens, but in reality, your voices are far stronger than our voices. So tell teams what you want. All right, let's talk about PowerShell coverage. Okay. Okay, so we have this model for how you get commandlets, right? So it's basically you get modules, commandlets are, in, are, are available in modules. That's how you ship and share them. You can import them and then run the commandlets, right? So we'll get, here are all the modules. Notice I got sim commandlets here. So let's import those. I'll import those modules, that module. And now those commandlets are available to me. So I can just say get sim class win32 BIOS. Happy days. Now we added auto, auto um, module auto logging. But in fact, that just simplifies this basic mechanics. Commandlets are in modules. You list the modules, you import a module, and then you run the commandlet. So now I'm going to try and run uh, get app locker policy, and it fails. It fails because that commandlet is not yet available on PowerShell version 6. So here I'm showing you a proof of concept prototype. We haven't figured out exactly how we'll ship this yet, uh, but it's of this new module called R module. Okay, so I'll import R module. I'll get the commands from it, and I've got copy R module, get R module, import R module, get R module. That's sort of like get module, right? So R, maybe remote. So get R module, list available, computer name. I'll do this to the local machine. And so now what it's doing is it's behind the scenes creating a connection, talking to that, and I'm getting the remote modules that are available. Oh, remote modules, yeah. So now we've now uniform, made uniform this idea between local and remote modules. So now I'll say, okay, well, is that true? Let me import one of those things. I'll import our module app locker, right? I tried that, that didn't work. And I'll do uh, localhost. 
And so what's this actually doing? And the answer is, it's using implicit remoting, right? If you're not familiar with implicit remoting, it's this wonderful feature that allows us to um, connect via remote connection, go to that remote machine, uh, harvest a set of commandlets, bring them over here, and create local proxies for those commandlets here. And then when you invoke those local proxies, you have, you have command completion, you have error checking, uh, parameter checking, uh, IntelliSense, et cetera. And when you execute it, it then runs, sends that to the remote run space, executes there, and gets the results back here. Okay? So remember, I imported AppLocker, and now I've got all my AppLocker commands in this environment. And so when I run get AppLocker policy, Voila, it works. Okay? So remember, yeah, is that cool? So let me go over that again. So I'm in PowerShell version 6, and boy, some stuff works, that's great, but some stuff's not there because they haven't ported it from Windows PowerShell to PowerShell. So now what I do is I use implicit remoting to make it show up in the PowerShell version 6 environment, and when it runs, it runs, uh, uses remoting to do that. Okay, that's great. So now, get that adapter. Uh, that, that doesn't work. Okay, well, it tur turns out that there's a whole set of things. If you recall, we really kind of broke the back of coverage with uh, uh, SIM commandlets. Right? Once we allowed the Windows team to write commandlets in native code using SIM, then we got fantastic coverage. Well, guess what? The SIM commandlets work just fine in PowerShell version 6. We got to get those teams to do their full test coverage and, and acknowledge that, but they do. So here I'm going to find out, right, PowerShell version 6, I got 367 commandlets. That's not so good. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy our module, and I'm going to say copy the compa compatible modules to this directory v6 compat. Okay? So what it's doing is it's running, makes a remote connection, it um, remotes connection, it then looks for these SIM modules, knows that they're compatible, and makes a copy of them, and also has a white list of ad additional modules that are, uh, uh, that are compatible, and copies them. And I went from 367 to 1853, okay? So now, right, getting that adapter didn't work, but now when I run it, just works. Happy days. Okay, so that's pretty good. Um, now I'll do get module list available. Shows you all the, the modules that I have, right? These were all the things that came over as part of that SIM module, compatible SIM module. But now what I did was I went and uh, just yesterday I got a, a um, the new set of commandlets from Azure that support, support .NET Core. I, the things I deleted, I brought back this, brought back uh, my buddies from VMware, I got their commandlets, I got the Google commandlets, and I got the things in the gallery that, the things in the gallery that explicitly say that they support .NET Core, and now when I say get command, Count. It's going to take a while because there's a large number. 9,400 commandlets. Okay? So, 9,400 commandlets that are now work in PowerShell version 6. So, pretty good days. So, the point there was yep, with PowerShell version 6, the initial set of commandlets uh, is smaller than you get with Windows PowerShell but through uh, you know, third-party support and through, well, this remote coverage, I didn't count many of those, um, uh, that number's going to grow rapidly. So a lot of people ask, okay, great, I got Windows PowerShell. Do I have to convert to PowerShell version 6? You know, when do I convert? And the answer is, you know, for you, you know, if you're a user, do so when it makes sense for you. Right? Uh, these things work side by side, so you can have them on all your machines together. Uh, certainly, if you're going to be doing things from Linux or Mac OS, you're going to want to do that with PowerShell version 6, because that's your only choice. Um, but some people might never, never switch. You might just say, hey, Windows PowerShell is it for me. That's fine. Now, if you are a commandlet provider, however, that's a different story. If you're a commandlet provider, what we want you to do is we want you to 
uh, compile your commandlets against the .NET standard and the PowerShell standard library. And what that does is that then allows your commandlets to work in both Windows PowerShell and PowerShell version 6. Okay, one set of commandlets work in both environments and uh, work in, in Linux. And for people writing scripts and modules, things that you write and share with others, put up in the gallery, uh, we encourage you to support both. But whatever you do, we want you to declare which versions you support, right? And that's with the tag PS edition underscore core, right? Now, great, happy days. Now, people want to know, great, what's in PowerShell version V next? And the answer is, I don't know. Seriously, I, I, I don't know. And the reason why is that with PowerShell v6, over 50% of our PRs, our pull requests, came from the community. Okay? So when you ask me what's in PowerShell version 6, I only know what things we're going to invest in. I have no idea what the community's going to invest in. So here's where we are. We're doing all of our planning out in the open. We're being very explicit about that. You can follow this link to find all the projects. Well, here, let's, 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 let's show you this. Is that a good idea? Yeah, so here, all the telemetry uh, is all available. So here's where it showed you the pull request created. Microsoft had 50.29, and the community had 49.71% of the pull requests. Here, what things we're investing in, we have this full list. Here are all the projects that we're working on. Okay? Now, to do a stack pop globally, these are the three things that we're in, Microsoft is investing in PowerShell. Okay? Number one, cloud and service management. Should be no surprise there. Number two, programming in the large. And number three, community feedback. Okay? These are the three large buckets, and roughly these are the priorities. Okay? So with community feedback, guess what? Community has lots of feedback. We're going to be able to fund a portion of that. You can fund as much of that as you'd like. Right? You can you say, hey, those idiots, they didn't do this feature. Just code it, baby. Just code it, do a PR, have a pull request, have a unit test. Uh, we'll accept those, and your code will be in uh, PowerShell. By the way, that's a pretty amazing thing, right? Now let's, let's, let's stop here a second and put this in perspective. If you contribute code to the PowerShell project and it gets accepted, now all of a sudden it can be, your code's going to be used and installed on not millions, not tens of millions, but hundreds of millions of machines. How cool is that? Okay. Now, a lot of people will sit there and they say, well, yeah, that's cool, but I'm not a C-sharp programmer, you know, and this delegate, oh, you know, that's too complex. You do not have to be a hardcore developer to contribute to the project. And to show that, I'm going to bring up Joey, who's going to demonstrate this to you. And I'm telling you, everybody can participate in this ecosystem, and you can do and, and make, make it better, and then have your impact show the world. What should we do? Found a couple error messages that we could, uh, we could fix up here. By the way, everyone, how many people are perfectly happy with the PowerShell error messages? <laughs> One. This guy. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Not so much the rest. So you don't have to be a, a C sharp programmer to help us fix our error messages. Yeah, and really, like I think it speaks to oh, nobody can hear me. I think it speaks to the fact that there's a lot of progress to be made. Uh, that I came up with what it is we wanted to improve in the last 15, 20 minutes. So, uh, you know, there's a ton of stuff out there. You really don't have to look that hard uh, to find places where we can improve PowerShell. So, By the way, so we do all of our development in GitHub? Yeah, have we so found here, an error message? Yeah, here we are at the, uh, the project here. So we're going to go into the source. Wait, did you find the error message? Show oh, the error the, message, the error message that we want to we yeah. break here. Okay, so, um, so this is a good one. This doesn't look uh, elevated. Can I use this guy? Yeah, okay. go. So this is going to complain. Oh yeah, yeah. Update help. That uh, although we've got a little surprise on the update help front later today. Oh, do we? Stick around for the lightning demos. Hey, well, he's finding the error message. How many people? How 
raise your hand if you've never used get. Oh, come on. Somebody's ne got to never have used get. Is that true? Yeah. You're too, too popular. Okay, you. Come on. Come here. My friend, you are about to make the lives of everyone in this room better. Do you have, do you have your shortcut elevated by default? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's the problem. Oh. The error message I want to fix is the one complaining about elevation. Oh, sorry. Oh, let's go. Here, do this one. What do we, is that, that'll give me the same thing? I, I just opened no. it from run. Here. Yeah, right there. It's, this is not elevated. Help. Or what's something else that needs elevation in PowerShell? Anybody? Start service, install module. There you go. That, that would have worked, actually, install module. Okay. Go yeah, for this it. This is going to. Remember I mentioned I deleted all my demos, so it might be a little rough. All right. Oh, that's, okay, fine. Let's do this one. Um, so this is an error message that is a block of red text. Uh, one of the things that I would like to do is separate the error message from the mitigation of the error message so that when you're scanning down the page, you can see, oh, hey, I need to run this thing as administrator and not a whole bunch of gobbledygook about why we failed that is irrelevant to you when you're trying to get your job done. So what we're going to do is search for this error message in the repository, and I'm actually going to have uh, you take over here. Um, so we're going to search for uh, the command could not update help topics, blah, blah, so blah, blah. So just cut and paste from here. So we're gonna like a little Cut and bit. paste this guy. That's good enough. Copy. Okay, and Alt tab over to Edge. That one. There, there you go. And just go ahead and go to the top and just search for that error message. Right there. So you see, here we got help errors.resx, right? So this is the file where this thing's stored. All we have to do is jump into this file, select it. Wait, it's as easy as that. Find a crappy error message, search for it in our repository. So at this point, um, all we have to do is click the edit button here in the upper right-hand corner. Um, oh, we're not on a branch here, so you got a tree. This, we changed something earlier, so this is uh, uh, not gonna happen to you, but if you go to master here, it's the main branch that we're gonna fork off of. So we edit the file, and now find that, find that string again here in this file. Control F. Next result, was I gonna, nope, okay. No? okay. Actually, if we scroll right. to the bottom here, um, in the, the right scroll, sorry. Uh, um, maybe do the control F from within this thing. There we go. I think if we just scroll the file, we're gonna see it pretty obvious here. Um, yeah, so, so here we've got, uh, keep going, keep going. Access is denied. Here we go. So access is denied. The command could not update help topics for the PowerShell course. So let's go to where the mitigation is further to the right. So if you just scroll, scroll all the way to the right here, we say to update these help topics. Be nice if we put a line break there, right? Make it more readable. So you're just going to go to this spot, just backspace and add a line break. All right, and then we actually, uh, because of some wonkiness, we need to make sure to get rid of this white space here that cannot be indented if we want this to render properly. Um, but other than that, that's it, right? So now if we scroll down to the bottom here, you'll see the only option that we have selected is create a new branch for this commit and start a pull request. So you should, you know, maybe add a, a right here at the top just a nice message that says added a line break to uh, update Jeffrey, help. Jeffrey made me do this. Error message. There you go. It's true. Yeah. I am yeah. doing this as JP Calvert. It's all good. So all you're going to do is hit commit changes. And this is going to start a pull request. And then you can summarize your changes here in the pull request. Um, this is a pretty pretty lightweight PR, and we're, we got time, so we're just going to go ahead and, and go through. But this, this PR checklist gives you everything that you need to do in order to uh, make sure that the PR is good to go. And then at that point, you would hit create pull request. And there we go. We're making PowerShell better. All right. Give it up for Brad, the latest member of the PowerShell community team here. Thank you, Joey. 
So indeed, you know, and there's just tons of opportunities like that. Formatting, uh, help messages, everybody can contribute to PowerShell. All right, now, in terms of cloud and service management, what we're gonna focus in is uh, basically helping people consume the cloud and the services. So this gets back to that core mission, from any, to any environment, be able to manage anything, uh, Swagger-based commandlets, Swagger is a way, you, REST APIs are very popular, and Swagger is a way of uh, uh, annotating your REST API to tell people how to use it. And the Azure SDK team has picked up support. They were doing all the um, .NET, Go, Java, Python, somebody else, something else, five, anyway, five. Uh, and then we were doing the PowerShell Swagger commandlets. Uh, they have decided that they are gonna officially support PowerShell. Uh, so they're gonna generate all of that stuff. And this will work for you know, Azure commandlets, it'll work for any REST API that annotates stuff through Swagger. We think that's gonna be very important. Production quality gallery, uh, right now our gallery is great, but we need to make it more production quality, very highly available, uh, low latency access to everywhere. So basically when I, I go to my friends at VMware and I say, hey, you should put all your stuff in the gallery, I need to be able to look at them with the, you know, with the, head and heart in the right place and say, your customers will always be able to get your code when they need to as quickly as possible. Uh, and so we've got some improvements to make there. We are gonna do those. And has anybody seen Cloud Shell? Yeah, so Cloud Shell, if you haven't seen Cloud Shell, I'll just quickly. Azure, Azure Portal. This is the Azure portal. It's nice and zen-like. No, there it is. And notice here, right? There's our prompt, Cloud Shell. And you click it, and you get a, a command line interface right here, right? And this can be Bash or PowerShell. Um, and even within Bash, you can run PowerShell. We get the Linux version of PowerShell in there. Pretty awesome stuff. Now, the other thing we're gonna do in this area is to drive features. So a lot of features that are in Azure um, are based upon PowerShell. Update management. So if you have a VM in Azure, we'll tell you when it needs to be patched. We'll do the patching for you. That's all using PowerShell. Uh, inventory, that's all using desired state configuration. We can tell you what systems on both Linux and Windows, um, the inventory of things. We can tell you when they change with change tracking. Of course, we've got Azure automation, configuration management, which is desired state configuration in the cloud. The Azure security baselines, those are all using desired state configuration. In fact, for this, uh, we uh, generated the new, it's using the new uh, desired state configuration LCM. So we have a native code version of that that's extremely lightweight uh, and is used for this. And we have what, over 2.5 million? Over 2.5 million uh, instances of this running. So this has been incredibly successful. And of course, things like Azure Functions, uh, where you can do serverless computing and it supports PowerShell as well. Again, so these are the two big themes. Help people consume the cloud, help build the cloud. And here's, a, this is a virtual machine in Azure and you see things like, you know, basically most of the stuff under operations is all PowerShell and desired state configuration, right? <clears throat> Update management, inventory, change tracking. Now, where I'm spending a lot of my time these days is Azure Stack. And with that comes about a, a new set of challenges that really kind of highlight the, an area of growth needed for PowerShell, and that's the area of programming in the large, okay? Now, <clears throat> let me, how many people are familiar with Azure Stack? Okay, so some, not everybody. I'll give you a quick tutorial about Azure Stack, what it is. It's this first product in a new category, this hybrid cloud platform. We basically are taking Azure, Azure and running it on servers in your data center. Wow, okay? Now, it, is, it delivers a, an appliance experience, 
okay, an appliance experience that gives you self-service IaaS, PaaS, and cloud, and it's, it's not a DIY thing, right? It's not a bunch of raw hardware and best of luck, here's a rabbit's foot, you're gonna need it. No, 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 you buy this, you pick, it's very simple, you pick a vendor, you pick a size. This vendor, you know, uh, four servers. That vendor, 12 servers. This server, 16, whatever. And then they roll it in, and then they install it for you. You know, 24 hours later, you're using it. You get a portal, just exact, it is the Azure portal, but it's pointing to your servers, not our public cloud, okay? So it's an appliance experience. Now, it has to be consistent with Azure. Right? That's the whole value proposition. So I can allow nothing that interferes with updating that every single month, okay? And it's fully, the business model is dependent upon your success. How much does Azure Stack cost? And the answer is zero, zero, zero. It costs you nothing. Now when you use it, then you pay based upon how much you use. It's exactly the Azure business model. How much does Azure cost you? I don't use it, then it costs you nothing. I use it a lot, it costs you a bunch. Same model with Azure Stack. You only pay for what you use, okay? No, this is fantastic because what that means is I am like hyper-focused on making you successful, right? If I give you a crappy error message and you're like, oh, what do I do with that? You're not using my product, right? So I have a great incentive to make it useful. These are the Azure Stack internals. There's gonna be a test on this, so. <laughs> I wanna... now, now, here's the thing. So first off, you know, iWash, like good heavens, there's a lot of stuff going on here. This is actually a simplified diagram of what's going on. In fact, there's a lot more going on. Uh, and, and most of these components are continuously available or highly available. Now what that means is that there are not just one instance, but there are at least two and sometimes three and sometimes more than that instances of these components. So if something fails, uh, things, your service keeps going, okay? So, pretty complicated system. Now, here's how this works, right? We have scale units. Those scale units can have four to 16 servers. You always get three switches in each of these racks. There's a base motherboard controller switch to talk to all the base motherboard controllers to do like, you know, um, uh, IPMI. Then there's two topper rack switches. Remember I mentioned redundancy? Those have to get configured. You can have multiple of these scale units. That comes later in these years. And that's Azure Stack. And then we integrate that into your environment, right? So there's the physical integration, but then it has to be integrated into your identity systems, either Active Directory or AAD. Uh, all your data center monitoring and management systems and the board of devices, uh, all the networking and the BGP controls, okay? So the point is, pretty complicated system. Now, the point I'm really making here is, oh, wait, it gets better. We manage the entire life cycle of this Azure stack. I mean, the entire life cycle. Again, my number one mission is to reduce the friction and time from when an innovation happens in Azure to the time it's running in your data centers, okay? So what that means is I control everything and make sure nothing gets in that way, okay? So we do the deployment, we do the provisioning, we do all the configuration, we validate these systems, we do the monitoring, we do the diagnostics. If something, things will fail, we have an automated process for doing the field replacement recovery uh, of systems. We patch and update these every single month. We support uh, business continuity, backup and restore, and we entirely secure this thing. If you haven't seen our security, it is phenomenal. Lee Holmes and the team just did a fantastic job securing Azure Stack. Now, why am I going on and on about Azure Stack? Like, who cares? Jeffrey, you're busy, I don't care. Here's why you care. Azure Stack runs on PowerShell. 100%. I have over 250,000 lines of code of PowerShell and desired state configuration running Azure Stack. It's not the best PowerShell code, but I got a lot of it. <laughs> it's not just the creation and the provisioning. It's the production system. When you create a VM, where, a VM on Azure Stack, there are over 400, on an average of 472 PowerShell commandlets that get called to create a VM. Uh, in Azure Stack. Uh, Jia, 
was absolutely central to the design of our security subsystem, right? This is what allows us, basically we took a very modern assume breach mentality so that if you breach one section, it gives you nothing, right? Doesn't let you own the rest of the system. Using GIA gave us this compartmentalization. We have logging and transcripts for everything. And GIA's core to support. With Azure Stack, here's the deal. I'm never giving you the admin password. Full stop, don't ask, you're never getting it. If I give you the admin password, I love you, but you're gonna screw it up, okay? So I can't allow that, so you don't get the admin password. But there are times when you need to do admin things, so guess what we did? We used GIA. We created a GIA endpoint that say, hey, here are the things that you can do. If ever support needs to do something outside of that, then we have something where we can get admin privileges. This requires two keys. Microsoft has a key, you have a key, and that will unlock an admin account where everything is logged and transcribed, et cetera. Anyway, this incredible security system only enabled because of PowerShell and GIA. I saw the, some people here are gonna give some GIA talks. You should go check those out. It's an amazing capability. Now let me give you a step back here and, and give you a little bit of the history here. Prior to Azure Stack, there's something called cloud, called cloud Platform Solution. And this was a purely PowerShell-based deployment. And when we went to do the next iteration of that design, I said, hey, it was all PowerShell, but now we gotta use desired state configuration. And the team told me, I hate PowerShell. <laughs> really, okay, tell me more. What do you mean you hate PowerShell? As we drilled in, we realized that, that where we were, and this was with PowerShell version four, we were not giving these developers the things that they needed to succeed, okay? Because they were doing programming in the large, okay? So as developers, they had a tool set that they were used to, Visual Studio, they needed Visual Studio. They were used to uh, defining contracts as I'm gonna produce something, I'm gonna consume code from you and from you, I wanna express that contract in terms of a class. We were doing it in scripts, right? Script signatures. There were tools, I remember one, the, at some point the development manager almost hit me. I thought he really was when I was buying coffee. He's like, you cost me three days of my schedule. It's like, me? How did I cost you three days of your schedule? And he said, basically somebody had checked in some bad PowerShell and they weren't able to find out about it for three days. He says, why isn't there a lint tool like any other proper language? It's like, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, and they didn't have the ability to unit test things, okay? So these were things that were missing uh, and that why they, they did not feel that they could be successful as developers using PowerShell. And that whole improving programming at large was one of the big focuses for PowerShell version five, where we did Visual Studio and Visual Studio code support. We added classes, the new language mode, we added script analyzer, we embraced the PowerShell, uh, sorry, the Pester unit test framework, and then we improved all these things, right? The debuggability, the authoring of DSC, debugging jobs, et cetera. Went a, a large way, and that's what's really enabled us to use uh, PowerShell in Azure Stack. I mentioned to you it's pretty complex, and here's the point. We deliver this with an appliance experience, right? The degree to which you're messing around with that complexity means you're not using the system. So we try and do this like a car, right? You drive a car, everything's fine. You're not like looking at all the details. A light comes on, says put oil in. You put oil in, you keep driving. A light comes on, says put gas in. You put gas in, you keep going. That's the model for Azure Stack. Comes in, gets deployed, you use it. At some point a light comes on, says replace this disk drive. Replace this disk drive, you keep using it. Another point, a light comes on and says, replace this server, you replace that server, you keep going. Point I'm making is that, that we're able to deliver that very simple environment because of the hyper complexity of the previous environment, okay? And the hyper complexity, the fact that we have multiple levels of resilience and fault tolerance, the fact that we've got all this monitoring, et cetera, is the things that allow us to give you a very simple experience. Well, guess what, guys? That's your job as well. Your job is to help empower other people, empower them by giving them very simple abstractions and tools that they can use. And in order for that to work, you need to do the heavy lifting and to make a simple world for them. Now, challenges that we've had in Azure Stack. Number one, 
error handling. Error handling is a bit of a mess. Let me give you, uh, and, and this, I'm gonna propose something that we do. Right now we don't have a prototype for this, but I'm gonna kind of walk you through the problem and what I think the solution is. Now, as you know, we've always had this distinction between terminating and non-terminating errors, okay? And it has served us very well. However, not always. Let's see if I got this right. Okay, so I'm gonna, I have this module called error. Error has two commandlets, test non-terminating error and test terminating error. Well, that's pretty good. So when I test non-terminating error, you'll see, and I gotta make this smaller. You'll see that I get a bunch of errors. In fact, let me show you what that actually looks like. Edit. Just so you see the code. So basically, it's stop process. In, in Windows, if you stop something that's an odd, an ID that's odd, they don't exist. So anyway, so I stop these three things, and then the terminating error, I do exactly the same thing, but I say error action stop, okay? So I ran that, I got three errors, okay? So now what I wanna do is I'll say, hey, I wanna run this again, I want the error action to be silently continue, and I wanna grab everything and put it into a variable failed. And this is the kind of code that you write, because then what you can do is you can say for each error in failed, remember we collected everything, we're gonna write host, foreground yellow, fail, and we grab the error, the target. And so we had three errors, and I'm able to do that, okay? So that is the coding pattern you have for non-terminating errors. Now let's consider the coding pattern for terminating errors, because it's different. So a terminating error, remember, does exactly the same thing, but when you get an error, it stops. Okay, so test terminating error. We run that, and we just get one error. We didn't get three, we got one, because it's a terminating error. So now if you want to do the same thing and say, hey, fail ID and give the ID number, here's the code you have to write. So first you got to put it in a try catch, and then error is dollar sign underbar gives you the error, and, uh, and the rest of it looks the same. So now I do this. Yeah, great. What did I do there? Test terminal error. Louder. What? Ah, uh, oh, there you go. Oh, yes, thank you. Do. There you go. It takes a community. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's so true. I told you I'm, I'm a deeply flawed person. Uh, so there you go. And so, but now I have these two different coding patterns, right? And now here's the question. Like, okay, fine, you know, that's the deal, and there's a reason why we did that. Now, what you can do is you can do things like, hey, I'm gonna go and I will set, you know, dollar sign, uh, PS default parameter values, I'll say I want error action to be stopped for everybody. I'll execute that, and now, if I do this, notice I have only one error, right? And now, here I could say, I can say non-terminating error, and this code should work. Let's hope it works. And it does, okay? So by adding that default parameter value, that works. Okay, let me clear that. Okay, but now I'm gonna import another module, error two. And I have something that's called test error. Which code should I write? I don't know, I don't know. There's no way, it doesn't tell you whether it's terminating or non-terminating. In fact, some commandlets can have both terminating errors and non-terminating errors, right? So, well, let's just run it. Okay, and yeah, well, it looks like it gave me a bunch of the errors, so that looks like it's a non-terminating error. Oh, good Lord. And I've lost my mouse. Seriously? Oh, there we go. Okay, so, so now I'll go and I'll do that trick again. Okay, well, I'll say default parameter values stop and run it again, and it didn't work. Oh, why? 
And the answer is that error, that um, module, let's take a look at it, PS edit, error two, error. Okay, test error, it calls test non-terminating error, okay? And what happened, here's the heart of it, is that each module has its own scope. And so when I did this code to say PS default parameter values, it did not apply to the scope of that module. And if I want it to apply that scope module, and by the way, this is PowerShell, this is advanced PowerShell. Here's how you do that. Dollar sign M equals get module error two, and then ampersand dollar sign M. Oh my gosh. So what this says is run, ampersand run, dollar sign M in a module, a script block. So it goes into the scope of that script block and runs arbitrary code. And here, the code is set the error action. And now when I run it, it does what I wanted. Man, that's a pain in the ass. Like, not good. So imagine instead we had this. Imagine if we had something called PS on error. And with PS on error, you call a non-terminating, uh, uh, you call it with a non-terminating thing, that this script block would run every time you get a terminating or non-terminating error. So in this case, it would run three times. When I call a terminating error, I have exactly the same code, but it'll only run once. And this, you don't have to know what, what it's gonna produce terminating or non-terminating. You just call it and the right thing happens. Now, with that, you ran three errors. But what if you didn't want that, right? Well, we have a way to deal with that. And the answer is, you do exactly the same thing, but you add a break. So if you do that, this, the first time it gets called, writes out the error message, and then terminates things. This would just do one. And so you have a uniform way to handle error handling. Anyway, so that's something we're gonna be looking at. And it's one of those things like you say, oh, that's kinda of cool, but I have other ways to deal with it. When you have over 250,000 lines of code, man, you want some of this uniformity. By the way, the other thing with that is that that ability to have control over the modules, you know, PS dollar sign error variable being different, default parameter value being different for every module is a real problem in programming in the large. So we want better control over module and nested modules. Uh, PS breakpoint, PS breakpoint. We want to be able to break on an error, right? So right now there's no way to break on an error and then capture the state. So what we were trying to do is to rewrite all of our script blocks associated with remoting so that when I, you know, okay, so now think about this, right? You saw that complex hideous diagram and now I'm gonna patch that, right? So I got like a gazillion hosts, a gazillion VMs and I'm gonna, I'm gonna run script blocks on all of them, right? Well, what happens when something goes wrong, right? Bring out that rabbit's foot. No, so what we wanna do is we wanna say, hey, I wanna overwrite invoke command, take the script block, and basically produce a mini dump anytime there's an error. But I can't do that because I cannot catch when you have a failure. I can only catch at the top of the stack, not at the bottom of the stack. So that's a big issue for us. Classes, I cannot tell you how much I love classes. They're exactly the right tool. The new programming language mode is exactly the right tool for programming in large, but I can't use them to uh, create my own commandlets, and I can't use them to create domain-specific languages, which we'd like to be able to do. And with Azure Stack, man, I just need to be able to fix whatever I need, whenever I need it. I really need that open source capability. So what about, no, so that's, that's the heart of it. This is where we're gonna focus in on programming in the large, these sort of areas. Now, as we do this, a lot of people have been asking us about things like, hey, what about this Windows Services subsystem for Linux? Does that mean PowerShell's dead? And here's the real answer. The answer is, when Satya came on board, he said, hey, get out of your offices and go talk to customers and give them what they want. Now, part of that is we are breaking down a lot of the bureaucracy that we had in the past, and teams are becoming more agile. Part of that bureaucracy, in fact, bulk of that, over by 10 or 10 more. Great, okay. A, a large portion of that was, uh, 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 you know, 
bad stuff is good to get rid of that bureaucracy. Some of it you could argue was good, but it's all kind of gone. Now we have empowered teams, you know, that joke about there's a fine line between agile and random. So every team's out talking to customers, figuring out the right thing to do and going. And so here's the reality. The reality is it's kind of a messy world. And, but, but that's okay. You know, really it is. So yeah, this Windows service is for, subsystem, for Linux. Now you have Bash on Windows. So what's that all about? Like, why do we do that? And the answer is because you saw, you go down to the valley and you see all these open source developers, people writing code for Linux servers on a Mac. I don't know if you've checked a Mac lately, but that is a really expensive, really outdated piece of hardware. And, has, and, and we have these amazing machines. So hey, if we could just allow people to write their open source software on, a, on our desktops, that would be a compelling value proposition. And guess what? It is. They love it. People are like, oh man, I, I, can, I can spend like half the price, get a much better machine. Uh, you know, some of these Lenovo's, some of you had a Lenovo here at 64 gigabytes of RAM. Like, oh my gosh. Anyway, so that's what that's all about. Help open source developers do their development on Windows. That's what that's about. And here's the thing. That team was closely associated with the team that owned the console, the console that had not been invested in in like over 20 years, and now the console is reinvigorated, right? We're getting things like transparency. We're getting, I don't know if you've seen, uh, they, the latest uh, uh, Insider build has tabbed power shell, tabbed switches, uh, tabs in the console. So that's been great. Uh, this is also bringing us native curl, native tar, fantastic stuff. Uh, and just, you know, just driving Microsoft to a more general uh, command line culture. So that's fantastic. And then a lot of people have been asking me about these, you know, Python-based Azure CLI. Here's the reality there. The, here's the backstory. The backstory was Guthrie would go talk to people and say, hey, why aren't you using more Azure? And they say, because your Linux support sucks. It's like, oh. We had these Azure CLI commandlets that were written in, I guess, Node.js, and they're just not up to the task. So Guthrie basically personally PM'd this thing. It was a time well over a year out from when PowerShell would be available on Linux. We, we didn't even know that it would be a year. It could have been longer. And so we personally PM'd them. Now, the fact that it's in written in Python means nothing. It could have been written in Go. Uh, but he needed to get that uh, ASAP, and that's what drove that. Now here's the reality is he did that and did two things at once. One was to drive the swagger based SDK approach. So now when a team, Azure team produces a, a REST API, we get .NET, Python, Go, Java, Node.js, all first class citizens. And as I mentioned, now PowerShell as well. Um, so that's a huge benefit. And as Guthrie was personally PMing them, he went and drove like the abstractions. He's like, these, these abstractions make no sense whatsoever. And so then he went and drove a much better set of abstractions, and those abstractions are now coming to the PowerShell environment. So happy days. So as I mentioned, this is all kind of a, a side effect of the common engineering criteria having been removed, but it's all good. So here's the net of this. And we started this from the very beginning. We always said, listen, the world is messy. The world always has been messy. The world is messy. The world always will be messy, right? And PowerShell is the glue that pulls together this messy world. By the way, why is the world messy? Unless you give up and walk away from everything that you have, you got legacy stuff. And unless you say, I'm no longer going to innovate, you have people who innovate, and innovators kind of break the rules, they go their own way, they produce messiness, right? So that's why the world's always messy, right? And if some part of it becomes less messy, it doesn't mean the whole becomes less messy, right? In general, it just gets messier and messier. So that's what we're all about. We're all about, oh, sorry, before the predictions, we're all about trying to help you solve that problem. And I'll tell you, let me tell you a story. I was a young buck engineer at Digital. And I was doing this management product around distributed remote user management and working our butts off on this project. And at some point I stepped back and I said, hey, wait a second. The only reason why I'm, I'm doing this, the reason why I have a job is because that team over there screwed up. Like as soon as they stop screwing up, I mean, that's what management is, right? Management is compensating for the screw ups of other teams. As soon as that team stops screwing up, I'm going to be out of a career. I'm now a technical fellow at Microsoft 30 plus years later. Uh, turns out there's a growth business in messiness. Uh, 
So it's a messy world, PowerShell, as a, as a firm place. So now, predictions. These are my personal predictions. If these come true, great. If they don't, don't hold me to it. Number one, PowerShell Core, I predict that will be renamed to PowerShell. PowerShell Core has this convention, is, it's like caveat to it, sends the wrong message. The message is PowerShell is our future, and I think we'll change the name to reflect that. We're gonna to talk to you folks, and give us some feedback, but I think that's what's gonna happen. Ships, ships is, I don't even know what the heck ship stands for. Simple hierarchies in PowerShell. It's very important to pronounce the P, ships. <laughs> ships is a way you use, it's very important, it's a way you can use PowerShell classes to create new hierarchies. And that's how what you're getting with uh, the Azure Drive and we're seeing a bunch of people in the community that are now taking this and generating fantastic new things. In fact, uh, Robbie over uh, at Dell produced one for the PowerShell European Conference. And so you mount the European Conference schedule as a drive and you can CD into day one, do a dir, and uh, and so I believe that ships is going to reinvigorate namespaces. You know, namespaces were always awesome, but they were just so hard to develop. Uh, we have more work to do on ships, but I think that that is going to reinvigorate namespaces. People are going to rediscover why namespaces are wonderful. I mentioned to you these swagger-based commandlets. I think... I think as the world moves to microservices, as the world moves to services, uh, exposed through REST APIs. What, by the way, why is everyone exposing things through REST APIs? Here's a simple question. Hey, is everybody going to program in Go? No. Is nobody going to program in Go? No. Okay, what about Python? Same answer. What about .NET? Same answer. What about this? Doing things in REST, exposing your APIs via REST means it's easier to access the widest range of languages and runtimes and client environments. You can invoke a REST API from Python on Windows, from Go on Mac, from you know, .NET on Linux. So it gives you the maximal addressability. Then annotating those REST APIs with Swagger uh, gives you those things, and I think this will become, emerge as one of the most dominant ways to generate commandlets. Cloud Shell, the thing I showed you earlier, I predict that this will be ship as a Linux only environment. So Cloud Shell, you go up to the Azure portal, you say, hey, I'd like to manage Azure. We give you an environment. Now in the past, we gave you Windows running PowerShell and Linux running Bash. And then we went and said, well, actually PowerShell can be anywhere and I think we, Bash can be anywhere. Uh, and what we found was, boy, we have two different teams producing the Windows and the Linux image, and then we're telling people, we're trying to coordinate, and there's a whole bunch of extra work, and then the startup times are really not so good, but we're sort of fixing a bunch of that stuff. But what we really kind of looked at and said, wait, this doesn't make any sense, is that there are a whole suite of Azure-oriented tools that are being generated on uh, Linux, like Terraform, for which their Windows support is either not there or lags greatly. And so what we don't want to do is to have an environment where, hey, this set of tools is available here and that set of tools is available there. Having one image, Linux, I think uh, unifies that, aligns everything and makes it simple. Now the reason why we think this can be successful is because when you're in this environment, you're interacting with PowerShell. You're interacting with the Azure commandlets. You're not managing that machine. Like that machine could be an AS400, it doesn't matter. You don't add users to that, you don't manage services to that, you don't manage processes to that. That environment has exactly one function, run the tools to manage Azure. And in that regard, we think in the end when we pull in that thread, we'll do Linux only, because it gives us um, you know, uh, most efficiency and gives us a common set of tools that can be up to date constantly. Um, we have this desired state, I'm not sure this is a prediction as much as a, we're already doing it. Desired state configuration, uh, we have a desired state configuration, these local configuration manager, and uh, where's Kenneth? I told Kenneth we'd never, ever, ever have more than one of those things. 
Uh, he kept coming back and said, we need more than one, we need more than one. I said, well, you can't have more than one until you prove these design problems. And he came back with the team and, and solved them. So now we can have more than one of these. And so basically what you're gonna have is you're gonna have multiple LCMs with different implementation technologies. We have one in native code, very, very lightweight, very fast, fantastic, used in all their security stuff. Then at some point you'll be able to say, hey, I think I'd like to write some of these things, these providers in .NET, have a .NET core and then a full .NET one. Having multiple LCMs, they can be on different schedules. So in fact, maybe you have one that's in a process that gets updated every couple minutes, whereas one for the system updates every half an hour or so. So I think that's gonna work out. I predict that at some point the Linux distributions will look at the, what's going on in PowerShell and decide to include it in their distributions. Won't that be fun? And there's this term in the development world called a full stack developer. I believe in the IT world we're gonna have a, a corresponding thing and that's what I call the cross stack developer. Cross stack developer, full stack developers are very in, in fashion these days. They make a lot of money and they're sought after quite uh, vigorously by companies. A lot of competition for these full stack developers. I think the, exactly the th same thing's gonna happen to IT for cross stack IT. Cross stack IT are those people that are able to manage the entire stacks. You got Windows, you got Linux, you got this service, you got AWS, you got Google, you got Azure, doesn't matter, I can manage that for you. I think that is gonna be an incredible skill. How do you do that? Not by being an expert at all those things. You gotta become an expert at learning. You gotta become an expert at learning. Learning, engaging the community. That's how that works. So I think that's gonna become very, very popular. And lastly, it is not, we do not intend, Microsoft is not gonna invest in full PowerShell running on, um, or sorry, PowerShell version six running on full.net, um, but we're open source. And so anybody in this room can decide, hey, I think that's a good idea. And uh, I predict somebody here will, will do that. Not sure where it'll go, but. And with that, here's what I wanted to say. Digital transformation is gonna change everything and it's automation that enables digital transformation. I mentioned to you that it's 2018, PowerShell's never been more important, but here's the real story. It's 2018 and you have never been more important. You've been never more important to your customers, to your companies, to your community. So, What's in PowerShell version next? I don't know, 50% of it's gonna come from people like you in the room, okay? So you're gonna define the new future. So lean in, reach out, meet people. This is the greatest opportunity of this conference is to meet the people sitting next to you, uh, build stuff and make sure you publish it so other people can, can benefit from it. And with that, I think we have some time for questions? Nope. Oh, we don't. <laughs> Did I go long? Jeffrey Snover, everybody. Thank you.